Let's call this meeting to order. Uh, welcome to a meeting of the Board of Health. My name is Kay Leach and I'm serving as chair for the board. Uh, I'll ask other board members if they'd like to introduce themselves, please do so. Um, Ashley, is Ashley here? Oh, there she is. I see her trying Just to get joining, on. it looks like. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, Ashley. You want to introduce yourself to members of the public? Uh, sure. Uh, my name is Ashley Craner, and I'm currently the vice chair and I've been on the board for about 10 to 12 years or so, and it's been an absolute pleasure. Okay. Hey, thank you, Ashley. George? Hi, I'm next? George Hageman. I'm a retired professor of microbiology from IU, and uh, I also have been uh, a pleased member of the Board of, Ed of uh, Health for many, many years. Hey, Mark. I'm Mark Norrell. I'm senior lecturer in healthcare management and policy at the O'Neill School of Public and Environmental Affairs at Indiana University. Steve? Hi, I'm Steve Pritchard. I'm a retired dentist, and uh, I've been on the board for probably 20 years, roughly. Okay, and Carol? I'm Carol Toluca, I'm a retired pediatrician, and I think we just figured out I've been on the board 27 years. Wow. Uh, is Bob Wren with us? I don't see him. I haven't heard he's not coming, so he probably will join us a little bit later. Also with us tonight, our staff, uh, Penny Cottle, our uh, administrator for the health department. Penny? Good evening, Penny Cottle. I've been the administrator since 2008. And our health officer, Dr. Tom Sharp, standing behind Penny, which is why they both have masks on, Dr. Sharp. That's a good guess. <laughs> uh, I'm Dr. Sharp. I've been a, a health officer for more than 40 years. I, actually, I think it said 46 years. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's 45 and a half. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, well, we'll call it 46. Okay. <laughs> and, and then also with us tonight or this evening, we have uh, Margie Ross, who's our legal advisor. Margie, are you there? Right now you're muted and we can't see you. Yes, yes, I am here. I am on my phone. Shortly I should be on my computer and you'll be able to see me. But yes, I'm here. Okay. Glad to join you tonight. Thank you, Margie. I just texted Bob, Dr. Wren and Casey might have forgotten. Thank you, Steve. Okay, did everybody get an agenda? Yes. Uh, there's a change I'd like to make if, if, if you'll allow me to do so. Uh, under public health reports, um, IU has limited time, so I'd like to move them up to number one and then have administration number two and then uh, and so forth. So if it's okay with everybody, we'll do IU first on public health reports. Anybody object? Nope. No. Okay. All right. Well... Next uh, uh, is um, public comments. We always try at our, at our health board meetings to start off a meeting with public comments. So anybody that would like to bring an issue to the board, please at the bottom of your screen, just raise your hand and the technical department will uh, uh, let us know that you're out there. So if you have a, a issue you'd like to bring forth, we do ask that you honor the three minute rule and, and keep your uh, comments down to three minutes. So if there's anyone out there who would like to speak, please raise your hand. Penny, I saw you had something on the screen, but I couldn't see what it was. Oh, that was just uh, to tell Michelle that Sally Hudson will be presenting for the public health clinic. Okay. Nothing. Is, is there any member of the public that would like to bring an issue before the board? There are no hands raised. Thank you, Michelle. Um, okay, we'll move right along. Approval of the minutes for November 18th. Did everybody get a copy of the minutes? 
Any changes you want to bring forth? Well, as usual, I found a change <laughs> under, um, let's see. Under um, public health reports, next to the last paragraph where it says Kathy Hewitt, next to the last sentence, the sentence says, the purpose is to inform future public health workforce initiatives. And since you can't inform initiatives, I'm assuming there's a people <laughs> or else we want to evaluate public health force initiatives. I'm not sure what was what we meant there, uh, but that needs to be corrected. All right, we will note that. Okay, and then and the only other little bitty thing is down under a uh, regulation review where it says the current vaccination rates 57.5% full vaccinated. Should it say fully? Yes. Yeah, okay, and that was all I found. Thank you. Do I, I hear move, any I motion? move approval with those changes. We have I'll a motion second. and we have a second. Let's do a roll call. Craner. Yes. Hegeman. Yes. Norell. Yes. Pritchard. Yes. Talukian. Yes. Is Dr. Wren here yet? Okay, I also vote yes. We have a quorum, I also vote yes. So the minutes have been approved. Okay, we'll move down to public health reports and we'll hear from IU. I understand Scott Dawson is gonna be with us this evening and Scott's with the IU athletic program and he's gonna address the topic of uh, enforcing mask at athletic events. Scott, thank you so much for coming to talk to us this evening. And we're, we're anxious to hear what you have to say. Well, thank you so much for allowing me to join you. And I apologize that I, I can only stay a, a short time. Uh, but again, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. But and before I start <clears throat> specifically about the mask, let me, let me just mention a couple of things. Uh, the, the first thing is, is that uh, I really, I asked Kirk White if I could be here because I wanted you to hear it from me uh, personally, how uh, seriously we take uh, the, the, certainly the, the situation that we're in right now. Uh, we've done that uh, from the beginning, the health and safety of obviously our student athletes, our coaches, uh, spectators, visitors, everyone is, is the number one priority. It has been, is now, and, and, and always will be. Um, it's important you know that. In addition, the, the second thing is we've really just trusted the medical experts. You know, we're not in the business of uh, forming medical policy, making medical decisions. We've got a medical advisory group uh, here internal in athletics led by Dr. Larry Rank. It, it involves our chief medical officer as well, Dr. Michael Grange, also Dr. Tom Hersmalis. They form kind of our internal group. And then we also work with Certainly, uh, Dr. Aunt Carroll on the on the Bloomington campus, who's been awesome in helping guide our our policies moving forward. We work with closely with the Big Ten Conference. There's a medical group uh, among the Big Ten Conference as well that we follow their guidance. And, and then finally, I do want to thank Penny Caudle. I want to thank Dr. Tom Sharp. Uh, I think the collaboration and cooperation, as I talk to my colleagues around the Big Ten Conference, particularly. I think the, uh, the collaboration and cooperation is, is really uh, terrific here. And I feel very fortunate that we're part of this community. So having said that, I, I did wanna just, again, you hear it from me, how important the mask wearing uh, participation, uh, obviously going along with the, the current mandate, how important that is to us and highlight what we do to, to do everything we can to ensure it. Uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in a situation that just candidly is really hard to make certain there is full compliance. But I don't want that to reflect any negativity or anything that would indicate that we don't take it seriously. Um, the, the first thing that we do, and this is for every indoor event that we have, is we send an email out in, that, that is a, uh, a pre-game, pre-event email that really highlights 
uh, that, that we do have a, a mask mandate. And it's not IU Athletics, it's the Monroe County. Obviously, it's, it's the Monroe County uh, mask mandate that we're enforcing. And so we do that not just preseason, we do that before every, every game in our communication. Additionally, we've put signage. In fact, we've, we've really increased the signage as, as, as sometimes it's been a challenge to make certain people are wearing the, the masks um, all around the building. And we say this is as, as required by the Monroe County Health Department. Um, in addition, as fans are walking in the games, they're required to have a mask. And if they don't have one, we provide one uh, to, to anyone walking in. Uh, Simon Scott Assembly Hall, that venue has been uh, probably where we passed out the most masks because it's the largest crowds. But we average about three, three to 4,000 masks a game that we provide spectators coming in. In addition, then our, ev our event ushers, obviously any worker in the facility is obviously wearing a mask. But in addition, they, uh, we have our ushers in force as, as patrons are walking into their seats, reminding them, but then also they carry signs up and down the aisleways during timeouts to encourage mask wearing. We have video board messages we play uh, during games in Simon Scott Assembly Hall that, that really reiterate the, the mask mandate. And we do that several times a half. And then we also have public, public address announcements where Chuck Crabb, our PA, uh, announcer makes announcements about uh, publicly wearing masks. Having said all that, I think it's important that you know uh, a couple of additional things. Um, across the Big Ten, as we talk, uh, as athletic directors, as I talk to colleagues, um, full compliance in, in uh, large stadiums is really, really a challenge. It's not just specific to us. That's not for me, that's not me making an excuse at times when the, there is not compliance but it is extremely difficult, particularly when it comes to f having full compliance and, and, and also when they can take off their mask to eat or drink, which is obviously something that is, is part of the, the policy. So it's really hard. So what we've done is we really, as we've developed these protocols, we have continued to try to improve them, come up with new ideas. And there's a lot of exchange. I've got a Big Ten athletic director call tomorrow morning. And it's one of the things we'll talk about is what are people saying? What are they hearing? What can we do to, to help increase that participation? I, I will say that in the common areas around the building, uh, and I'm specifically talking about Simon Scott Assembly Hall right now, in the common areas, the mask wearing is, is terrific. It, you'll, you'll see masks. It's 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 almost uncommon to see people not wearing masks where the challenge is when someone sits down and people, you know, they'll eat popcorn, they'll do different things. And, and some people just to be, you know, candid, uh, you know, just pull their mask down and leave it down. And again, we do all we can to remind uh, people of the, of the mandate. So, uh, you know, I, I don't want to uh, ramble on it. I just want to make sure, and I'll be happy to answer any questions, but I just want to make sure more than anything, when I asked Kirk, if I could come, I didn't want you to feel, I, I wanted you to feel our commitment to this. And I wanted you to know how seriously we take it. And that uh, having said that it is, a, it is a challenge. And, uh, but I just don't want that challenge when there are people not complying that you think that's us uh, not taking it seriously because that's just definitely not the case. So with that, uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions that, that you have. Scott, two quick questions. Sure. Uh, to whom do the emails go that you send out at the beginning of the, the, uh, uh, the game or the season or the ticket holding uh, group? And secondly, how many people are fit into the, the uh, um, venue when you say you send out, you give out three to 4,000 masks, how many total would be possibly using them? Yeah, that's a great question. So we email any uh, ticket holder for that in potential game. And it changes from game to game. So for example, uh, the game coming up on the 22nd, uh, well, let me back up the 19th, we have a women's game. The 22nd is our next men's game in Simon Scott Assembly Hall. And uh, those are break games. So students don't have tickets. So we sell those on a game by game basis. So anyone who purchases a ticket, we have their name in our system. And even if they give that their ticket to someone else, they're instructed to inform who they give it to of the mask mandate. So those go out before every game and we do that. In terms of the crowd size, it varies from game to game. Uh, the men's games are the largest attended, although our women's program is certainly surging and attendance is, is, is really going well. But I would say on average, there's probably about 14 to 15,000 people there. The three to 4,000 masks 
the people that don't get handed out masks are obviously are bringing them in with us because they are following and know that we do require them. But we are noticing that that is going down, that more and more people are bringing them with them. But anyone who comes in who doesn't have a mask, we provide one to for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Scott? Yeah. Yes. Go ahead, uh, Mark. Thank you for coming before us. That's that's nice of you to do that. Um, sure. I, I do appreciate that. Sure. Um, can you point to any um, stringent measures that have been debated uh, in athletics um, that have not been implemented? You, you know, things that uh, ideas that have been floated that you've kicked around and said, no, that's that's going a step too far. Have, have yeah. you had examples of that that you could point to? Sure, 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 sure. The, the thing that we, we've talked about both at the Big Ten level and with my colleagues in the Big Ten and, and internally is, is, is do you have your ushers and, and ticket takers and, and support staff go a little farther and really start to point at people and, and really during the game try to um, really, it's almost like if you can imagine if you've been in maybe on an airplane or when a stewardess or a flight attendant would walk around and point. And, and the, the challenge with that, and, and no one in the Big Ten uh, thinks that's a good idea, and, and we haven't either because it's really a almost a pointless activity because with the with food and drink, as you're, you know, you could, someone could point to someone and they pull it up and then they're, they're eating something. And it's, it's just, and it's one of those things that you're putting a finger in a, in a kind of the dike and stopping one leak and it, it's hard. So it really uh, would put our support staff in a position that they're set up to fail. And no one has, has, so, so I guess to answer your question, that's something that we've talked about. Can we get a little more heavy handed uh, in terms of pointing people out uh, throughout as they're sitting watching the game, but no one thinks that's a, a real possibility to try that. It just won't work, and particularly with the food and drink, and also just with people watching the game, the, it would create almost more negativity than it would accomplish by getting the masks up. But that is, yeah, I think you know your your consequence is to eject somebody from from a venue, and and that's just that's going to be. I mean, it, I just don't think I agree with you. I don't think you can. I you know. But there is no other consequence short of that. So yeah, what, what we're really trying to do is is continue with our communication to mix it up and to really uh, come up with creative ways through our messaging, through even just as people are coming in and talking to them and, and when we're walking around to encourage mask wearing as a positive and not make it a negative. And I think our fans, what we've seen, are more responsive to positive reinforcement rather than, as you suggest, a negative of, hey, you better do, you do this and it's your last warning and we'll try to eject you. And again, doing that would be really just really challenging to get that done. Although I, I understand, um, you know, the seriousness of it. I just think because someone can always just have a, a, you know, a drink in their hand and pull it down and say, I was drinking. It's just really hard with the, with the, the, the food portion of it and drink. Right. Now, see, on campus in my classroom, I am large and in charge, right? I'm right, there. right, and, right. And it's, it, in the classrooms, it is very easy to gain compliance. Correct. Because they know there's a consequence and they, they know exactly what, what I would do, right? So it just takes, it, it just, it's like I'm a parent. And if I give them the look, they put their mask back up properly. It, it's a great point, Mark. And, and we've talked about that with the other, you know, my other Big Ten colleagues with large venues. It's just so hard to do that in a large venue. It just really is. But I agree with what you're saying and, 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 uh, and, and respect that a lot. It's just, it'd it just be hard to do with that many people there. Scott, would it help? Sharp, do you have a comment? Yeah, well, a question. Uh, would it help to kind of add into those reminders that we're trying to protect our team so that all of our players can play and are not infecting the rest of the team because that would really infect our so, uh, so and, and people that aren't wearing their masks are more likely to pass it around obviously you know dr sharp that is a an excellent point and it's funny you're you you, you it's like you've had a premonition because you're you're ahead of me on this in terms of you know there are a couple schools around the country that are are seeing uh, because of some upticks among their team having to pause games. Uh, you, you'll see that uh, coming up. 
And so to your point, and you know how many, how rabid the fan base is, if we really urge them that this really protects the team as well and, and protects the environment, we want to keep it going. We will, we will, it's a great suggestion and we'll definitely do that. Start really uh, going down that road. As well. yeah. The one thing I know, the one thing I notice, and I, I attend all the men's games and all the women's games mm -hmm. uh, and, and wear a mask the whole time Good. Uh, <laughs> is that there is mass non-compliance with the, with the fans that are closest to the team and closest to the floor. I mean, I counted one day, there were 50 some people lined up and I sit in row H uh, or section H row nine, actually, it's right behind where you used you you used yeah. to sit or some yeah, of your family did exactly and across from the bench and uh i counted on my side of the floor uh 50 some people sitting on the floor maybe around 50 and i think there were 10 masks and the mm -hmm. whole thing and this was mid game and these these they were and this was in the first half so they weren't all eating so i i think a, a good message and and it would be easy to remind those people to wear a mask now i realize that you know those are those are also, I mean, here's the reality of it. I understand they're big donors and they're, and they have expensive seats, uh, but there ought to be a nice way to encourage them. And, and using Dr. Sharp's strategy for protecting the team, I mean, that's a really powerful thing. If they care, which they obviously do, uh, you know, they, they should have their masks on down there. You know what, that's, that's a great suggestion. And, and, and I couldn't agree with you more in, in terms of, it's important, it, it doesn't matter for sure uh, how big of a donor you are or who you are, you know, we're all in this together. And I, and I do think, you know, combining kind of your thoughts along with Dr. Sharps, particularly as closer you are to the court, that it's probably even more imperative, although, you, you know, you can argue it's just as important for the person in the last row. But, yes. but, uh, but I, I think you bring up a great point. And we have talked about additional measures around the court just for that very fact to protect our team. So, uh, so I appreciate those comments and we will do more around the court and it is, you know, just like the classroom, you know, when people are closer down there, it is easier to, to, to maybe have communication than it is when in the big, large bowl. Yeah, that group behind, behind, the, point. behind the team, is, I, I don't think those are donors. Those are, they look like guests and friends of the, friends of, I, I walk by them a lot of times coming in and it looks like a, uh, high school kids uh, well, that are recruits or yeah, it's a combination behind behind the yeah. bench is a combination of, yeah. of of recruiting as you said there are definitely recruits and families that come in along with um, you know certainly some some season ticket holders back there as well it's a combination and and again not uh, please do not take this as any excuse whatsoever at all it's not but it is, you know, it is challenging depending where people come in from and we just remind them, but, but we're, we're depending where they come from, sometimes th there's not mass mandates where they are. And so it's different, but it, it's, it's something we just continue to work on uh, to make certain there's, there's compliance. It's, it's a very tough job. I, I certainly understand. But, but yeah, yeah, I, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I, thanks for coming, Scott. I sure. appreciate being here. Sure. And, um, I'm, I'm, I have two comments. First thing is I am concerned about the people behind the bench because those are the people that everybody sees on TV. Right. So, no, I agree. So the, so the impression that people get who aren't there is right. that nobody's wearing a mask. Right. So, uh, you know, right. and, and we try very hard to get other areas of the you know, city and county to enforce it. So it makes it really hard. It looks really, you know, it's a little right. embarrassing, frankly. Uh, my other comment, though, one thing you did say was that, you know, people eating and drinking, have you considered just getting rid of concessions? Well, that that may cause a whole nother set of problems. It's a good it's a good point, but that just creates a whole nother uh, almost. You could almost argue that it's it's a you know particularly with when it comes to water. I mean, we just have to have that, and then and then the uh, you know again just to be candid with you, the the fan experience. If we would say in the arena there's no food or, or drink available, would be a, a really a negative negative reaction. But you know down the road we'll just we'll see how this goes. But but it is that's something we have not contemplated. But I'll bring that up. I'll, I'd be interested to see what my Big Ten colleagues would think about something like that. Down put some food trucks outside and, you know, yeah. Yeah. No, I understand. they can eat and drink before they come in. I mean, yeah, no, I understand. People go two hours without eating, okay? I understand. <laughs> they do it all the time. <laughs> I understand. No, I do. I, Scott, a follow-up on what uh, Mark asked earlier. Um, I know it's a big tumult when everybody's coming in and going through the, the, uh, the turnstiles and everything mm -hmm. coming into the venue. Uh, but would there be the possibility of, of enforcing uh, 
at least showing the possession of a mask. At the oh, time we do that. They come into the venue. Yeah, we do that. We we do we for hundred percent sure you can't come in without one. That's why we hand them out. Is if you don't have one, you have to put one on. You have to have one. Yeah, good point. But thank you. Yeah, thank you. Any other comments or questions for Scott? Scott, we really appreciate you being here. We recognize what a challenge you have. We have the same challenge. Uh, and a lot of our comments we get are, why are you picking on me when at the sporting event, nobody wears a mask? Right, right. You know, and I'm sorry so about that. And, and that's why I physically wanted to be here because I wanted you to hear it from me directly that this is not at all athletics thinking it's no big deal or we're not supportive. We are right there with you arm in arm. And, and trust me on that. We want uh, the same things you want. And I did, you know, I said it at the beginning, but, you know, Penny and uh, Dr. Sharp have been awesome. You know, we, in fact, I'll say one last thing before I leave. It was really interesting. This shows you, we have vaccinated 44,091, provided 40, 44,091 total vaccinations out of Simon Scott Assembly Hall since March 29th, which I was just handed that uh, late this afternoon. So I, I just say that to say that in, in, in we should do that. We're part of the community and we feel really great about it. We feel as good about that as we do about a, a win and a game. And I mean that because it, it's our, our duty and our obligation as a part of this community. Um, but I say that because I just want you to know, um, you know, we want, we want the same things you do. And I just want you to hear it from me. We'll continue to brainstorm. These ideas here are really good and we'll do everything we can to increase the compliance as best we can. Well, let's hope we can find a way to be successful, all of Thank us. You. Thank you. Well, sorry <laughs> I've got to so run, much. but I've got a meeting at five. I've got to go to. But I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. And again, thank you so much for your support. Appreciate Thanks, you Scott. coming. Thank you. Okay, next on our agenda is administration. Penny. Sure, thanks, and I will be quick. Uh, Graham McKean did send me numbers, so just what Scott was talking about. Um, I'm going to take this off just long enough to do this. Um, last week, um, well, no, I take that back this week, right? This is finals week. So IU had a vaccine clinic, uh, a Moderna clinic. They gave almost 2,500 vaccinations uh, during that time. Um, and looks like probably 30 maybe were full doses. They did first, second, third doses, so a lot of boosters. Um, and um, we're going to have a mobile clinic on campus in January, so we're working with IU on that. Um, and then Scott mentioned uh, the total over 44,000 in Assembly Hall at their public site this past spring. So they've also done almost just shy of 15,000 influenza vaccines this fall. So they're, they're making a lot of strides there. So I wanted to share that um, since Graham couldn't come. And then in terms of staffing, I just wanted to mention Tomorrow is Kate's last day. Kate's been my assistant this past year and she's always tuning into these and taking notes. So just an official um, goodbye and good luck to Kate. She is going to be finishing up her degree next term and doing her internship in Wisconsin. So we wish her the best. She's and done then, a great job and we're gonna miss her. Yes. And she came in in a very difficult time and just stepped in and his, um, with really not a whole lot of direction at times. She's, she's been great. And Kendra Mood is the new um, assistant and she will begin officially on Monday full time, but she has been here this week working with Kate on a, as a part-time employee. So we were able to manage that to get that training in. So Kendra is on here as well. So welcome, Kendra. We, we appreciate you and welcome to you. And then we filled our DIS assistant position and Jean Graham started this week in that position as well. And Jean is a retired nurse who has been working in our vaccination clinics this past year and, and a great help. And she is 
joined us as an official employee on a part-time basis. So I wanted to welcome them. And then you've heard me mention this, I've referred to it as the school grant that we're getting. I think the official name is Crisis Co-Ag Supplemental Workforce Grant. And it is, again, is sort of that COVID, but it is public health response funds for, and it's coming from the State Department of Health. So it's coming passing through them to local health departments to actually help schools. So we have officially gotten that award. The commissioners um, approved it yesterday and will ratify it in January. Council has appropriated funds and we're working on a job description for the position that we will have to fill. And Sally's on here next. This position will also give a little extra help to Sally. So um, I know Sally is excited to get that in place as well. And we have a part-time person with us right now that we think will make a good fit for that position. So those are my just added updates for you. And uh, when we get into here, I'll have some additional notes. Okay. Anybody have a question or comment? I do Cheryl? have a question. I do have a question. This has to do with testing. Is there any progress on getting the gravity site someplace inside so they don't have to shut down when it's raining? Um, I do have um, on my slides in a moment. They are going to stay outside. However, they are making some changes so that it can remain a drive through, but the weather won't create reasons to close as much. So they're bringing in some pods or trailers um, so that they're close. Staff don't have a long way to go. They're just kind of right there and they can handle people well. So they have been working um, communicating with us more recently um, in order to do that. Yeah, that's good because I think testing is an issue around here. Mm -hmm. um, I actually went over, I went over there before it started raining and I got there like, a, you know, a little bit after 10 when they closed. So I, I went online to try if I could find a place to get a COVID test day because we're leaving town with, you know, and uh, you can't get one in Bloomington. Yeah, it can be a challenge. It mm -hmm. cannot, yeah, I get the, the closest place I could get, I could get one in Brown County tomorrow afternoon or I could get one in Spencer tomorrow morning. But I mean, it's like there's all the CVS, now the CVS is close to CVS where I could get a test was in Bargersville. I mean, it's, it's, you know, we, if you, we need people to be able to get tested. So I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, because you need to be, and we need to have a reliable place we can go. You know, otherwise people are just going to say, ah, I'm not going to do it. And, you know, I, I think that it needs to be, if you want people to get tested, if they have symptoms or if before they go to gatherings and that kind of stuff, I think we need to, you know, make sure that they can actually do it. Right. And we do encourage people who can, um, you know, if it's certainly if they're symptomatic or there are reasons, if they can go to a site, we would encourage that. But if not, home testing is another option as well. And the state's looking at some other uh, opportunities, perhaps around home testing kits, but there's also a shortage of um, some of the tests, home tests, some of the rapid tests. So Most people the have states, to pay for them. And I think yeah. that, that that's a real barrier for a lot of people. I mean, I don't care oh, I'll pay for it, but you know, there's, there's, that's a barrier for a lot of people. Well, so Penny, why is that? I mean, I've noticed that, I mean, a lot of more rural communities have this testing. They have a clinic or something. And Penny and I uh, drove, Penny, Penny Gaither, my wife, <laughs> I dr drove down to uh, Seymour to get a, a rapid test a few, well, this was maybe a year ago or something like that, because we had to have that to go somewhere. And, and I thought, of all the things we don't have, I mean, all things we do have here, I just don't understand why we can't have a, why it's so difficult to get a test. I've had people ask me, you know, you're on the board of health. Why, why can't we get a test here? I, I have no answer to that question. So I'm glad it, it came up. Well, again, weather has been a big factor. We closed the community site and keep in mind, nobody was going. So, you know, demand was low. It closed, demand increased. It's much harder to set something back up. While we were working on that, the state had secured these gravity sites. Um, it has been a rough, I mean, I 
I have no defense. It's been a very rough startup and, and what have you. They have made some changes and have met with us. Actually, we really don't have anything. We have no oversight over that gravity clinic. It is a contract with the Indiana Department of Health. Um, but they have been communicating with us um, more recently. In fact, one of the people were scheduled to come down today, but I think they're the trailer is coming maybe tomorrow and they're going to come down and meet with Christina tomorrow. So we're working on that. Um, in terms of the rapid testing, um, again, the state gets allocations for that. Um, you know, some of the other counties have, you know, used funds and they don't have the uptake that we have on vaccinations. <laughs> And they're, you know, so they're doing some testing, they're doing maybe some vaccinations, but not to the extent that we have. I, we have more demand for both of those things than I think most of our surrounding counties. And that certainly adds to the challenge um, of that as well. I know Ashley Craner had a question. Ashley. Um. I wondered if Dr. Sharp might be able to answer this. Um, I recently went to the clinic and was giving some symptoms. What I just thought was kind of like a kind of like a stomach flu type thing. And um, the nurse practitioner mentioned that when you've been fully vaccinated, that our symptoms aren't as, they're not necessarily as they were before we were um, unvaccinated, meaning like I didn't have a fever, but I had stomach, I had all these other symptoms. And she asked me if I'd gotten tested for COVID and it didn't even cross my mind because I am fully vaxxed, but not my booster. Um, and so that's, that, and, and I get asked this too, kind of random questions like, you know, I'm not a doctor, but I mean, if you're vaccinated, are your symptoms different? You know, I mean, I don't necessarily want everybody running off to get, get COVID tests because, you know, or, or maybe they should. I mean, that's kind of where I'm at right now. I don't know. I mean, can Dr. Sharp or you answer that question? Somebody? Yeah. I can touch on, oh, I can touch on it and Dr. Sharp can add too. I know that, uh, you know, the state and their reporting symptoms certainly are changing. Um, and especially even, we haven't identified Omicron in Indiana yet, but we certainly expect it's here. Um, and those symptoms can be milder. Um, so certainly if, if you've been vaccinated, your symptoms, if you have them and, and you have a breakthrough case are likely to be milder so they may not be noticed. And I, the state would say, if you have symptoms at all, getting ruling out COVID is a good idea. But I will, other than that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Sharp. Well, as with unvaccinated and just uh, regular Delta virus or, or be, you know, even before, symptoms are all over the board, A to Z. And, uh, and they've changed maybe just slightly with the uh, uh, with the Delta virus and, and particularly vis-a-vis -vis the immunizations. So uh, Penny's exactly right. If you have symptoms of anything, almost, uh, I mean, it could be just a runny nose. I've heard several of those. You don't have to have the olfactory problem or the taste problem you you know it could just be all over the board okay but it's hard it's hard to uh, it, it's hard to, ca to exactly say what symptom is what because it could be anything so okay so i mean best practice would be if you're not feeling well rule out covid first is, is that what i'm hearing yeah well yeah with the exception of like hang nails and <laughs> No, <laughs> well, or a bad, or a bad yeah. golf stroke. Yeah. The other, the other thing that I think we have to keep in mind is what's the level of transmission. Right now, the state of Indiana has an extremely high level of transmission, so there's a good chance that it could be COVID. Um, so better to, to, you know, it's always safer to get that test and have it be negative and know that you feel, okay, I've ruled that out. 
Um, so, but you know, if you're symptomatic, if you have fever, stay away from other people is the bottom right. line and um, get tested if you can. All right. So with flu season coming on, even though we're pushing flu vaccines, us getting more COVID testing here in Monroe County is pretty imperative, it sounds like. Yeah. Okay. And the two, the two uh, I think I mentioned this before, but the two flu seasons prior to this last one uh, were 40, the immunization was 45 and 29% effective. So you can still get it. It could be mild. It could be really bad. It could be people die even of that. Uh, so uh, she's right. If, if you're sick, uh, keep your distance, wear your mask and, and get tested. If, unless yeah, it's something. I think that's true with almost any disease, we, infectious disease we have. It's not yes. really the COVID. You know, wow. you really, if you're feeling bad, you shouldn't hang around other people. Yeah. Well, as you know, we almost didn't have a flu season last year because of these masks. So they do something. Right. Yeah. Well, and there is a lot of other stuff going around. So, yeah. you know, it is flu season. There's other rhinoviruses and things that are circulating as uh, well. Including respiratory syncytial virus. And that, that one's... That's... Adenovirus. What? Adenovirus is the yeah. big all they're all still going around. This does not get rid of the unfortunately get rid of all of them, but the, the social distancing and the masks and not touching your eyes or nose or mouth helps. So wear the mask when you can. When you need to. Hey, any other comments? Sally, <laughs> we're at, we're ready for public health clinic. Sally, you're muted. Sally, uh, it looks like Sally is unmuted, but we're not getting audio from her. Um, it may be that you mislooked the wrong microphone. Okay. Sally, there's a problem with your microphone and we're not hearing anything. Looks like she may not be hearing us either. Yeah, I'm wondering. Sally, can you hear me? If you can, would you nod your head? She can. <laughs> she can hear me, but we can't hear you. It may be worth her uh, closing down and reconnecting. That happens sometimes with Zoom, so I would suggest it's closing down and reconnecting. Carol has suggested maybe you could close out and then reconnect, and we'll try it again. Do we have anybody from Security Pro here today? I don't see them, Penny. Um, I, I don't see them, Michelle. It's probably Aaron, um, if they are on. I thought that they were going to be here today. Uh, they don't appear to be present. Okay. Our meeting's so getting shorter. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle, we really appreciate you, by the way. Oh, thanks. There's no problem. Sally again. Okay, Sally, you need to do your video and also you're muted. There, now you're not. Oh, there she is. She's over here and she's over here on my screen. No. No. Sorry, we still don't hear you. Looks like they're trying a different computer. Can we come back to this? 
Okay, P or Penny, is there anything you wanted to report outstanding from the public health clinic? Oh, it looks like they may be back. Um, they've just been working extremely hard getting our schools um, in the school clinic. So the small clinics, are you there now, Sally? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. So, yes, I was just going to say we, we have been working extremely hard, just as Penny mentioned. Um, we've been very, very busy doing vaccinations, holding multiple clinics per day. Um, we go out to the elementary schools. We've gone to all of them once now, and we hold a clinic for COVID vaccinations, including boosters and pediatrics in the public health clinic five days a week. So um, over the last quarter, I estimate we've done about 80 clinics. So we're getting really tired, but we're willing to push through and, and you know, get as many people vaccinated as possible. Um, several of us did a rough count and we came up with slightly different numbers, but we think we got about 6,600 COVID vaccinations given total during this time and 2,600 of those were pediatric five to 11 year old doses. So we're, we're making a dent um, and we plan to continue. We're gonna go back to all the elementary schools in January. Uh, we have about, I think 21 on the, on the list right now um, so that we can do second doses for those kids that we already vaccinated. We, of course, we'll also make available the first doses. Um, so we've just been extremely busy with that and all the other stuff we try to keep going. Um, but it's, it's hard, but we, you know, our main focus is vaccination. Yeah, I really appreciate your effort on that. I, I want to point out something that came out in our town hall that we did last week. Is that it, it was like it was maybe 10 days ago we did this. There were 2,400 or so kids between 5 and 11 vaccinated in Monroe County, only 9,000 in the entire state. And, and there's, it's, it, we've done great down here. You guys have been spectacular. And, uh, and the people, like the parents are saying, we can't get a vaccine. Well, we're going, they're going to every county around us to get them. They're going everywhere to get vaccines. I, I think that the parents of this county have done great. And I think you guys are doing a fabulous job getting vaccines to these kids, better than anybody else in the state. Thank you. It's been a massive effort. Um, it's taken a lot of coordination, you know, with the health department. Um, and we've had volunteers. We've pulled in a lot of PRN nurses to help. Um, and we did four mass clinics for children, just for the five to 11 year olds. You know, so that really boosted our numbers, got a lot of people vaccinated um, in late November and December. So we're just gonna push forward. And Carol, I think we ought to thank you for the town hall uh, that you helped do too. Excellent you did a great job. job Excellent with that. job, Carol. Yeah. Um, thank you. I, I think that the uh, other three pediatricians did a fabulous job answering questions as well. And, and, and also, we had parents submit the questions ahead of time. So it was great. I think everyone did a great job. It was great. It was actually fun. I'd do it again. It was really fun to do. <laughs> And you, we got a great story in the newspaper after it. So yeah, yeah two know, of them. Yeah. Wow. yeah, and they didn't even misquote anybody. It was <laughs> astounding. It was great. <laughs> okay, thank you, Sally. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sally. Okay, we're down now to regulation review. Um, last time we met, we. We, kept, we agreed to keep the regulation as it was going, and we did not put an end date on it, if, I'm, if I remember correctly. Um, where are we with it now, Penny? Well, that is where we are. Can you see my screen? I'll just go through some of the numbers with you. Um, you know, unless you want to uh, make some big change at at this point, I would say we're kind of uh, just moving forward. So I did want to talk about testing. We, we already touched on that. 
We have the Gravity site, which is still currently open Tuesday through Saturday. We are also talking about potentially trying to expand uh, some of those hours to include Monday. Um, not sure how that's going to happen, but eight to four uh, is still drive through. As I mentioned, they are working to set up a different pod system so that the weather will not become a problem. They are still looking to add rapid testing and they're working with the state on that. Uh, but we do not have, we still don't have a date. And that is a state, I think that's more from the state and the and gravity side. I'm not sure exactly what the issue is, but I was on a call with the state and they are still working on that. So we still anticipate at some point rapid testing being available there. At the commissioner's meeting yesterday, I mentioned that we had asked for a mobile clinic and it was gonna be on the west side of town. And later that the, in the afternoon, um, we had a change of plan. So we had to pivot. And I want to give a shout out to the city parks department. Um, we had a staff person who, when we were looking for sites very quickly, said, what about Switchyard? And we contacted city parks and the city, and they said yes. So next Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, we will have a mobile clinic. Now, it will be inside. It'll be in the pavilion. Uh, from noon to eight, but they will have vaccine for all ages. Um, so get your booster, get your first dose, whatever it is you need. But they'll also have testing available and they'll have rapid as well as P PCR testing. And these are the clinics that the National Guard help with. So that will be Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of next week. Indianapolis Motor Speedway remains open and I've got the dates and times on there for that. They vary a little bit. Again, they do vaccine as well as testing. And if you're looking for a site, the coronavirus.in.gov is your best source for what's up to date because they that site includes the mobile clinics and they change every week. They move across the state. And I mentioned earlier, we are requesting one for early January. So we're working on that. So hopefully that will be going um, before the students really come back. So kind of those pre-arrivals and after the holiday testing that people may need. So we're looking forward to getting that. Uh, vaccine availability, and we've already really talked about this. So the Monroe County Public Cl Health Clinic on Miller Drive remains open. We're doing school clinics. Those two, those super shot clinics that Sally mentioned, we did two. Then they went back and did the second doses. Those children at the last clinic will be fully vaccinated by Christmas Day. And then mobile clinics, we will continue to bring requests and bring mobile clinics to town um, as frequently as there is demand and the state will send them. Um, and then providers offices have vaccine as well. Pharmacies have vaccine. Um, so again, ourshot.in.gov is the way to find that vaccine nearest you. And then in terms of boosters, this I think is helpful for people to know. Everybody 16 and older can now get a booster vaccine if they are six months out from their Pfizer or Moderna series or two months out past their Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Now, if you're 16 or 17, it's got to be Pfizer, so you don't have a choice. But otherwise, you can mix and match those two. And then I wanted to go over the advisory information with you. And these next slides, they are all on the dashboard. So for anybody watching that may be saying, where do I find that information? These are all taken from the dashboard. So this is this week's advisory level. You can see the whole state is either orange or red. And if you really want to dig into it, if you go to the dashboard, you can click on any of those counties and you can get more details about them. So one example is if we look at Monroe County, you can see that this week we have an orange advisory, our cases per 100,000 or 260. That's actually slightly down just a bit from where it was last week. Um, and our positivity rate is 8.9%. And eight 
0.98%, and it's down slightly from where it was last week. So you can get this same picture for any of the counties if you want to go in in the dashboard and do that. So we talk about the two metric score. We talk about our advisory level and it is a measure of these different metrics. So here's where we are. Indiana as a whole is all red. That means that every county has more 200 or more cases per 100,000 people. So it's, there are some counties that have five, six, 700 cases per 100,000. Uh, we're at 260. If I look at the numbers today, next week, it's probably going to go up a little bit. I, right now, we're running about 55, I think, a day. I looked at Tippecanoe County, and they, I believe, are over 100 per day. I think it was like 130. Um, and then the, the other one is looking at the seven-day positivity rate. So you can see that that's where we're yellow and that, you know, we're in that 10 to, um, or five to 9.9% .9 positivity. So it's the combination of those two things that determines our advisory level. In terms of cases, these graphs are always kind of nice to, to look at. You can see we've got a little bit of a plateau happening here. Um, but we're right around a rolling average of about 55 per day. Now, we were looking at, we were down into 30. At one point, we were down to 19. And in July, we were down into the single digits, right? And that's where we were hoping we would get to. And then um, when you look at the testing, testing certainly kind of dropped off a little bit, picked back up. Right now, we're in that 800 a day range. So those right now are holding steady. Certainly IU can affect that and that affects our positivity rate as well. <coughs> the deaths, you know, we talked about last time, November, we saw a lot of deaths occur <coughs> in November, but I'll tell you this next slide is what I think is more telling. Um, and that is the age range in which people are dying. So this is for Monroe County. We have had deaths from as young as 30 um, on up. If you look at the same picture for the state, you will see deaths have occurred in every age group. And when we look at the hospital census, you, were, you will see that the hospital census is really about as high as it has been. Um, it surpassed their previous 2021 peak um, by about 100 patients. So our hospitals are overloaded. That Some of them have brought in some National Guard to actually help them with kind of routine things, how to move people here, there, and, and what have you, so that the nurses and providers can, can actually give care. Um, metrics, we've talked about this. So during the month of November, 81% of our COVID cases, 82% of our COVID deaths, and 94% of the hospitalizations, and this is by the state, were in those who were unvaccinated. And then of course, there's lots of discussion and concern about the Omicron variant. Um, it is in, has been reported now in 57 counties or countries. We have not seen it, we have not identified it in Indiana yet. There is no expectation that it probably isn't here but in terms of the sampling that's done, it's not yet been identified. That could be changing as we're in this meeting. But you can see just the drastic, all of the other, the Delta variant and, you know, and other strains have kind of had this, you know, slower trend up in terms of cases. But Omicron really is doubling very quickly. So we do see that uh, the information that we have right now is that it is pretty easy to transmit from one person to another. And another reason why um, vaccine and boosters are very important. 
So we know that the Omicron variant is likely to spread more easily. We're seeing uh, doubling occur every few days. Um, so that's important to keep in mind. In terms of illness, it does appear that uh, infections are more mild, but we don't have a lot of information on that yet. Uh, so more, more will come. Uh, we do expect breakthrough infections to occur, uh, but we hope that those will have less severe illness um, or death from those infections. Oh. Current vaccines are expected to protect against severe illness, hospitalizations, and deaths due to the infection with the Omicron variant. However, breakthrough infections in people who are fully vaccinated will likely occur. And with the other variants, vaccines have remained effective at preventing severe illness, hospitalizations, and death. So the recent emergence of Omicron further emphasizes the need for vaccinations and boosters. And there is a concern as well with treatments that with the changes in the genetic makeup that some of the treatments we have will continue to work, but some of them may not work. So the next steps for you, and I will just mention that, um, you know, there's OSHA standards that are expected um, to take effect in January, but that's kind of pending. There's some legislation or some appeals going on with that, but that emergency uh, temporarily would require employers with over 100 employees that those employees have to make a choice. They either are fully vaccinated by January 4th, or they permit their employees who do not want to be vaccinated that they need to provide a negative COVID test on a weekly basis. And if they're unvaccinated, they must wear facial covering indoors while at work. So we don't know if that's really going to go into effect yet or not, um, it, but it is certainly a possibility. We also know that Indiana legislation, our legislators met in, um, earlier and then decided to wait and deal with this in early January when they come back. So they are looking at some rules that would limit the capacity of the governor during pandemics to require certain restrictions. What that looks like, uh, what it looks like for local governments, uh, whether or not we have the ability to make changes, uh, what we might be able to make will also be affected. And some of this legislation that's in here, the emergency orders really do impact our hospitals. So they currently affect their ability to respond quickly, to adapt to increased needs, that if some of this legislation were to go into effect, may really hamper some of the, the adaptability that hospitals have. So unless you intend to uh, rescind the health order tonight, and I I have a feeling that's not in, in the, the cards. So uh, I would say that just in the next few weeks, assessing and evaluating what the new year is going to bring. So what changes could, could you make to increase the response and the impact uh, to our community? Associations can I be identified? You know, we can look at Yes, our numbers have been a little bit better. They are a little bit better. We're a little bit slower maybe to hit those higher numbers. But what we can't do is, sh is show direct cause and effect. We have a lot of different mitigation strategies in place. So it's very difficult to say, are we in this position solely because we have a mask mandate because of our vaccination rates? And I'm not saying they're great, but again, compared to some other counties, they're pretty good, right? Um, so we have to keep those things in mind. It's very difficult to show direct cause and effect, and it makes it more challenging for you as you make these decisions. But I would also say consider what is the impact for us as one county out of 92 um, and 94 health departments, right? Um, and what are the pros and the cons to us being the the lone county with different regulations, right? There's always pros and cons to everything. So those would be the things that I would think about over these next few weeks. We'll have to set our meeting agenda, you know, our meeting times for next 
year and certainly need to set a time, I would say early in January to meet um, and to think in terms of what, what you want to do, um, but also knowing that what Indiana, this legislation, what that ends up looking like um, may affect what our ability to do or not do is. That's what I got. Thank you, Penny. Penny. Penny, a quick question. Some of the data on the ISDH website is reported as for District 8. Could you remind us what part of the state is District 8? Well, yes, we are District 8. Um, and I cannot tell you every county, but um, it is us. I think it's Bedford, it's Jackson County, Brown County, uh, maybe Bartholomew. Uh, so it's kind of that circle of counties. Thanks. If Christina was on here, she could rattle them all off. But our our DIS, our, our disease, our STD program is District 7. Now I worked in that for you know 12 years. I can slowly rattle those 12 counties off. But District 8 is where, where we are for the rest of things. Yeah. Um, I could jump in. I think there's a map. I can put it in the chat. Um, of the our, our counties, but they're Monroe, Brown, Bartholomew, Lawrence, Jackson, Orange, Washington. Does that sound right to you, Penny? Yeah. For this date. Yeah. So it, <coughs> yeah. So um, yeah, we go down as far as Washington County and the, and Orange County, and then beyond that, Crawford and Harrison are not in our region. So Thanks, we're Martin. surrounded. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. I do want to note that Mark had to leave because he was giving a final, but we do have Dr. Wren with us now, and he's been with us some time, so I recognize Dr. Wren. Thank you. A little technical part getting my computer to open up the program, but it finally did, so. I had some problems, too, but I got through. Okay, uh, do I hear any more discussion about the regulation? I, I did hear, I did read something this week that just really hit me that I, it said that there were four states that was responsible for half, one half of the nation's COVID situation and Indiana was one of those four states. I couldn't believe that. I mean, it just shows we have a lot of work to do in Indiana. I think there was new cases, yes. Yeah. That's why we need masks at games. The increase, yeah. Well, the regulation, let's talk about it. Is there any need to change it? I don't think there is. I don't know why we would under the current circumstances. No. Yeah, I'm not comfortable with making any current changes either. Thanks, I Ashley. Agree. Okay. Well, we don't need to make a motion or anything because um, it, it's as business as usual. Is there a deadline on our um, for this, or do we just keep going automatically? Well, so. And Margie can chime in when I'm done. So I would answer that in a couple different ways. One, even if you wanted to make changes right now, the Board of Commissioners would have to approve that and they don't meet again until January. So in our, so in our current, other than if you wanted to rescind it, right? That, that's the one thing that you could do without their approval. Um, the, the order, the current regulation has those benchmarks that if we meet, right, if we're in a blue advisory and our cases are below 50, that the order would rescind. And certainly we're far away from that right now. So it's not going to rescind on its own. Um, the, the other thing goes back to that legislation and what that could look like if they limit 
what counties can do if they take away that executive order from the governor, if he removes that emergency, then that can affect our order, our current order and the ability to potentially do new orders. And I'll let, I'll turn it over to Margie now. Yeah, I mean, and also I wanna say, you know, as we're thinking about legislation, keep in mind that Monroe County has hired a lobbyist. And so to the extent that you have questions um, or we wanna get certain things in front of our lobbyists to push in Indianapolis, we can do that. Um, if the um, governor's order expires and let's imagine it expires in January, I don't know what's gonna happen. And I was talking to a lobbyist just this week on the phone about, you know, gosh, with these numbers, it sure doesn't seem like the governor is gonna be able to do that, but who knows? And, um, and she also represents, that lobbyist also represents the Indianapolis or the Marion County Health Department. So everybody's wondering what's gonna happen. If it expired and then we wanted to put in a local emergency declaration, that has to go through the emergency uh, declaration statute that has its roots with the emergency management division and the county commissioners, not the board of health. So I double checked with the state um, health department attorney just to make sure that it isn't the local board of health that would make that emergency declaration that would go back to the commissioners. But again, everything could change if state law changes. Um, so, you know, I think, um, you know, obviously it makes sense to keep this in place right now, the way things are. Um, as Penny said earlier, and she alluded to, you know, at some point you have to, you have to wonder if, if what we're doing is making a difference and is actually, I mean, we've had it in place and our numbers have increased. We may very well be, and this, this is something what Scott Dolson said about the, the person in, your, in the finger trying to hold back the, the dam from breaking, you know, hold back. At some point, one county with a mask mandate may not be actually making a difference. And, and you have to ask yourself whether that's what, something you want to continue if you, if you do think it's making a difference or, uh, I mean, I, I, I question when our numbers are raising and we have the mask mandate in place and we're having troubles enforcing, as Scott Dolson said, it's, it, the problems he's having are problems that the health department is also having. So think about those things and you know we'll, we'll see what the world looks like in January when we meet again, whether there's a governor's order in place, whether the commissioners wanna to act to make a local health de declaration, whether you want to continue to staff to focus on enforcing a mass ordinance or you want them to spend the resources doing, you know, something else, maybe you work on vaccination, right? I'm not sure, but those are all conversations to, to look at and think about, and then we'll see what the General Assembly is doing as well. So I'm happy to, I'm answering questions. I do want to just say, uh, you know, we do have the, as you know, we're not going to discuss details about litigation a lot in public, but I want to tell you that we do have an attorney conference scheduled in the Seven Oaks case on January 3rd, that'll be via Zoom. Um, we'll sort of know about our schedule for that case going forward. Um, I have, um, you know, we're continuing, we have filed our answer in the case and we're just sort of, nothing's moving in the case right now. We're just waiting for a schedule from the court. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we're down now. I think we're ready to talk about a meeting schedule for 2022. It's hard to say 2022, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, Penny, you're suggesting an early a meeting in early January. Penny, you're muted. Penny, you're muted. <laughs> Darn it. <laughs> I almost made it through the meeting without <laughs> messing that up. So I think that you probably don't want to meet so early that the General Assembly hasn't met yet, right? I think they right. convene on the 4th. I, I have no idea how quickly they will move on anything, right? But I, 
and I don't know if you want to meet on Tuesdays. You've kind of have started liking these Thursday meetings, uh, you know, so I wouldn't meet before the 6th. If I were going to meet quickly, I would, you know, you could look at the 6th, which is a Thursday. The 11th is council night. So I would, the second and fourth Tuesdays, we have council meetings in the evening. So we'd like to avoid those. But other than that, I think it's um, up to you. We can always, if you want to meet later in the month, more mid to late month, we can always call a meeting earlier. If something happens in the General Assembly, we can always call a meeting earlier. Is it the 13th is too late to set a meeting? Uh -huh. I'm sorry, say it again, Carol. I couldn't hear you. I asked if she, she thought the 13th was too late to set a meeting. I, a Thursday. I like I like the Thursdays because we have data from uh, uh -huh. Wednesday. And I think if, if we are making decisions, I like to have data. Yeah, 13th works for me. Yeah, I, I'm leaving town on the 6th and I won't get to my destination till the 8th or 9th. So I can I can be online by the 13th. So okay. You like this time, 4.30? I do. Anybody? I like it. Earlier or later? Let's, let's tentatively set it up for January the 13th at 4.30. Great. Does oh, that yeah. work for everybody, as far as yeah. you know right now? Okay. Now, do you want to set even, you know, nor in normal circumstances, you met quarterly. Do you want to set something up kind of ahead or do you just want to say we're going to schedule them month to month? Yeah, this is not normal. And so no. I, I, I kind of want, I want to see what our destiny is as far as the legislation and and so forth. And we can decide then and, and also how, how this COVID rate's going to get? Are we going to go down? Or are we going up? I mean, it's kind of a month-to-month -month thing, I think, personally. Yeah, I, well, I, agree. I agree. I think yeah. you know what? After after the holidays, we're going to have a you know big surge. You know that, and then we'll give it time to see if it settles down after that. And then until we get to that point, I don't think there's any kind of decisions we can make because we're in the middle of a surge. And now, uh, I just didn't know if you wanted to set times for say February and March or if you just wanted to schedule them you know the schedule next month's when you meet I, I think schedule the next month when we meet okay well I mean that's just my opinion I'm just one person but I, I, that's what I'm hearing. I mean that's what I'm hearing but everybody agree with that yeah these are important times you have to keep up to date yeah, I agree. And we're also seeing nationally more mask mandates coming through. So, you and know, we're seeing a lot of employer mandates. We are. I think they're making so, a difference. We'll make a difference if they're not challenged too much. Okay, so our next meeting will be January the 13th, once again at 4 30. You guys um, have a great holiday. I'm Do sorry. The they have a great holiday. Yeah, you know, we're, we're down. We're down to board member comments, and I I do have a comment. Oh, uh, I wanted to say that uh, I've been your chair now for these meetings for a couple of years. Ever since COVID started, <laughs> I tried to count the number of meetings that we've had, and I quit counting at fourteen, and that was just for this year. So I think it's time to pass the gavel, and I want you, you to think about. Uh, somebody I mean, volunteering or or someone you'd like to no nominate in the next year. I've so, done a very good job. You've done a good job. You've thank done you. a fabulous yeah, Kay, job. You've done a great, yeah, Kay, you've done a great job. Yeah. Oh, thank you so uh, much. But I, I, I do think that it's time to share. <laughs> well, we do have somebody on our board that hasn't been chair. I know That's true. That. We do. One guy. I know that. One guy. <laughs> We don't want to put undue pressure on anybody, but 
it's time it's time to think about it and if you if you have somebody you want to nominate or if somebody would volunteer just let me know and i'll let penny know so when do we do that january your january meeting okay. is your organizational meeting <laughs> you think i'd know that after all these years but <laughs> i didn't know either steve i thought it was january but i wasn't sure okay any other comments George? just a quick comment to the effect that we are uh, kind of the uh, experimental um, source of a big public health experiment in the state of Indiana being the only county that really has a mask mandate. I mean, we're really showing the way for a lot of other counties. So in our consideration of our rules and things like that, we might also keep in mind the fact that we're the tip of the spear here and we're uh, both providing an example and also some data that can be uh, compared with the uh, uh, situation in other counties. So just a point. Well, and I, as Margie was speaking, I, I had just looked at the dashboard before our meeting and I did a little circle of the counties around us. And yes, our rates are up, but we're still lower than the counties around us. So I do believe we've made a difference, but we'll see. Uh, Quick comment, I really appreciate all the interest and effort and time from the board. You, you, uh, you don't know how much that helps. And, and supporting Penny is uh, uh, something that uh, all of us need to do. She's doing a great job and working really hard. And there's lots to do. So uh, again, thank you so much for uh, your time and effort. Well, we appreciate you guys too. Okay, happy holidays, everybody. I hope you stay safe out there. Enjoy stay your holidays. Have a, have a safe and healthy holiday. Mm -hmm. Safe travels, Carol. Nice <laughs> holiday. Thank you. See you guys. I'm, I'm, happy holidays. We will adjourn. Bye, everyone. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.